What's up, everybody? Mr. Mirror here, and we are back today with another GitHub teacher help or GitHub classroom teacher help. I still don't remember what we're calling the video series, but we are back with another video, and this video is going to be about unit testing. It is the second video in our three, maybe four video uh, series or subsection, whatever we're going to call this one. I don't know. I can't get the name of the whole series right, so I have no idea what we're going to call this subseries here. But basically, we were asked to do auto grading, and how do we do auto grading in GitHub Classroom? It takes a little setup to do. So we got part one was making a Palm file in a Maven project inside uh, Sublime Tech, so we don't need an IDE. You can use one; it makes it easier, but you don't need one. Part two here is writing unit test, and then part three is going to actually be setting up the auto grading. So it's a little work to do behind the scenes, but might as well share that with you instead of just showing you the final project of doing the auto grading with everything already set up. Let's see the steps that it takes to get there. So. Off screen, what I did was do a git ignore file. And let's actually, let me show you, zoomed in here, our folder. So I added a git ignore file, I added a readme file. The readme file has nothing in it, okay? Readme file git ignore is filled as well. So I also then added inside, you can see here. So inside our SRC, then our subfolder main, then our subfolder Java, I actually added a Java class called three randoms.java. So that's all I did off screen. So that's where we're going to pick up right now to get started. So I'm in my three randoms.java. I like to have the class, the regular class, the non-unit test class already made first for a couple reasons. It allows me to kind of start thinking about what I expect students to complete and what their code is going to look like. And also it allows me to determine what the class name is going to be. Because when running unit test, it suddenly becomes very important that students name classes what we ask them to. So it's no longer, if you're planning on doing auto grading with unit test, it's no longer a student gets to pick whatever class name they want and a student gets to pick whatever method name they want. It becomes very important that the class name is called X and that the method names are called Y. So it does kind of take away some of the naming creativity. If you want to have them practice naming conventions and get used to naming conventions, maybe you don't do unit testing until after they're already used to it before you start saying, okay, here's what you have to call everything now. And again, you can call it whatever you want. It's just, they need to make sure they call it the same stuff. So we have our class here called three randoms. And let's pretend that I want students to write three methods. First method, I'm going to have them write, I want it to be called hello you. And I actually want this to be a static method. So I'm going to have this static method called hello you. And its goal is to take a string and print out um, hello blank, whatever, whatever the string is, right? So I probably should say str. I don't want to spend too much time uh, writing this part because that's just going to waste time. The next method we're going to do, let's have this one be, we'll have it be static as well. And we'll call this one count dog. And this one should essentially count how many times the word dog appears in a given uh, string. Okay, and our last method is going to be called flip-flop. It's not going to be static, and we'll see what that means when we go write our unit test. And this one is going to say, we'll say like return true if given two ints, one is positive and one is negative. So that's going to be our, yeah, I like that. I don't like that it scroll the screen. So we will go like that. Um, so those are our three tests that we are going to write for. Those are the three methods in this assignment that I expect students to complete. So I told them the method names and I said that some of them need to be static. And then hopefully by these instructions, they would be able to determine, okay, I need a, a string here, what the return type should be, what the parameter should be. But return type also becomes important and parameter data type order becomes important as well because we will be calling these methods from our unit test to get specific answers. So we need to call the method and we're going to call it a certain way. So their method signature needs to match the way that we are calling it. So unit tests become kind of difficult that way since we're writing them, the students aren't writing the unit tests themselves. We are writing them. So the students kind of have to match what we wrote 
instead of us matching what they wrote. So it becomes a little trickier. Um, you know, like I said, it, it takes away some of the creativity on naming convention and practice that way. Let's go write our unit test and students don't need to have any code in here, right? We have the instructions. We can go write unit test based on what we expect the results to be from these methods. So I'm going to go into the test folder. I'm going to go into the Java folder in there and I'm going to make a new file. And this file is going to be called three randoms test dot Java. So when making a unit test, file. It's the same class name as whatever class you're testing, except it has the word test on the end. And then we have our curly brace. And that's, that's how, that's the setup for our unit test file. So above this though, I'm going to have a couple imports. So the imports, the basic, the most basic imports that I use are those two. And then I do get more if I have other types of tests or tests that do different things. There are ways to get parameterized testing and all that kind of stuff that we're not going to cover here. But that is something that you can do in unit tests, which makes it a lot easier to write some unit tests for certain uh methods. So we have our class here and we have our import statements done. So now we're going to be writing in the, uh, the class here. And I like to start by doing uh, display name. Now display name essentially makes it easier to read what the test being run is in an IDE. Normally when the test is run, the IDE will print out the class name and the method name. But if you give it a display name with this at symbol, it will print out that. So you can be a little more specific here. You can have spacing in here because this is just a string. So we're going to say like, hello, uh, you passing in, uh, we'll say blank. And that is the test that we're kind of running here. So our method should be, you know, testing that. The second thing that we need is the at symbol and then the word test. So that, nope, thank you, autocomplete. So it does, we need the at symbol and then test. This lets Java know, this lets the JVM know that the method below this is a unit test method, a test method. The next thing that we're going to do is actually write our method test. Now, when naming methods, there's lots of discussion on various viewpoints on how to name unit test methods and things like that. I usually try to go with one of the two following strategies. There's a lot more, but there's two. And I'm going to only show off one that I particularly like using more recently. So I'm only going to show off one of the two that I'm going to discuss here. But the first way is to write your test and I'm going to say void, right? So that's the return type of the test, but it's to write the method name as the feature to be tested. And you simply just, your method name is simply write the feature that you're testing. That's your method name. So that way is not bad. Um, it sometimes gets tricky when you're running like very simple unit tests like this. It becomes difficult to write a very good test name. But the other one that I kind of like is, uh, spelled out like the word should and then underscore what the expected behavior is and then the word when and then the state of the test. So I'm going to say like should return string when should return string. We'll say should return string. Hello blank, I guess when given blank. I mean, again, that's that's not the greatest name, but it's good enough for the uh the example, I guess. So inside here, let's write our actual test. So I'm going to say, there's a couple different ways we can do this. Let's do it string expects, and we're gonna say hello blank. Okay, and was this one, this one was a static one, correct? Yes, okay, so then uh, string received equals three randoms, or three random, no, three randoms. Why is it, oh no, I misspelled that. Okay, let's rename, awkward, yes. Okay, so there, now we're matching. Three randoms dot hello you, we're gonna pass in blank. So I expect that. And now we're going to do our actual testing and we're gonna say assert equals expects comma received. So assert equals takes two arguments. It takes the expected answer and then the answer that it got, the actual answer that it got. So instead of saying expects, I could type hello blank here as a string. Instead of typing received, I could do this. It's just, I, I like making the variables first. Okay, let's do our next one. So I'm gonna speed up the display name part and probably the method naming part. And then I will come back, slow it down when we are actually in the method writing part. And then we're gonna say zero because I expect that to get zero back and then 
what was count's value. So assert equals will be returning true or false. Uh, did it match or did it not match? So another thing, when we have something like count dogs here, now it's it's good that this should return zero, but I also want to make sure that it counts dogs accurately. So when having test, it's sometimes when having a method, you want to test different features of that method. So does it return one dog? Does it return if dogs at the beginning? Does it return if dogs at the very last word? Does it return if dogs in the middle? Does it return if dog appears in the beginning, middle, end, end? So you should probably have like multiple different versions of this test testing different varieties. We're not going to do that. I'm only going to write one other version. <laughs> So this one is a non-static, so it's an instance method. So I actually need to make a three, three randoms objects. If all my methods were instance methods, like if I was having a class and I wanted to test various features of the class, there's actually a method that you can set up that says before each test, kind of set up a... Uh, object of that class, or you could say before all the tests, set up an object of that class so you don't have to create an object in each one of the classes. You can create it once at the top and then use it uh, as you would any instance variable type of thing like that. So this, I mean, just because this is a unit test class, you can still do instance variables and all those other things that you can in normal Java classes. There's no like limitation where you can't do that anymore. So it's still a possibility. Just wanted to show that off. And what is this? This is going to be Boolean. We'll just say like result is equal to t dot flip flop, right? And this is the both the same sign. So if I do like negative nine comma negative seven, and then I can say assert, I want to say assert, uh, this should return false. So I want to say assert false uh, t. And this will verify, or I'll look awkward in the next video. This should verify that T is false. If T is false, this passes. If T is not false, this fails. If I'm remembering it correctly, it's super late right now. And my brain is not cooperating with remembering Java. <laughs> Now that we have our unit test run in the next video, so I'm going to off screen, I guess, I'm going to push all this up to a repository on GitHub. So uh, we've already seen other videos on how we push up to GitHub. I'll actually link those videos. It will pop up in the upper right corner right now. It'll pop up and say, hey, watch me. I will show how in that video, it shows how you take a repository like that you made on Sublime and push that up to GitHub through Sublime Merge. So I'm going to do all that off camera, but basically I'm going to get all this, this project, essentially this CS Tut uh, project and push it to GitHub. And then in the next video, we will start on GitHub, GitHub Classroom, getting this test on there, running these tests and all that kind of stuff. So until then, everybody have a week.